Thumbs up, Lorianne. Ready to go? Okay, excellent. Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to Parenting Strategies, Life Skills for the Pre-K Crowd. Parenting Strategies is a virtual program designed to connect parents with early childhood specialists. I'm Betsy Brainerd, the supervisor of early literacy librarians at the Arapaho Libraries, Libraries and I'm thrilled to bring you some in-house experts today. Mary Kuhner is an early literacy librarian with 22 years experience who has been with the Arapaho Libraries for five years. One of the main programs that she runs for us is Learning on the Go, providing free books and literacy ideas for children ages zero to five. Lori Ann Armstrong runs our Reading Readiness Outreach Program, providing coaching for preschool teachers so that they can help get children ready to learn to read. She has been in the early childhood field for more than 35 years, has taught at the college level, and has been on our team at the Arapaho Libraries for 15 years. Mary and Lori Ann have created a whole series of executive function videos, and we realized that our patrons would probably be interested in this content as well. I'm going to turn things over to the experts and they'll let you know how today's program will work. Thanks for joining us today. And we also have early literacy librarians, Molly and Lauren with us, and they'll be doing tech support and dropping comments and chat for interesting tidbits that you might need to know. So take it away, Mary and Lauren. Thank you, Betsy. Um, thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Molly and Lauren for helping out today. Um, my name is Mary Cooner. I've probably met some of you at some of our programs, and I'm very happy to be here with today with my colleague, Lori Ann, to share with you some of the things we've been working on during the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, Lori Ann and I often presented this uh, workshops on executive function skills um, and how children develop them to preschool teachers um, and librarians. And um, so during the pandemic, we decided it might be useful to make some videos with some introductions to these skills and information so that um, parents could have access to them and also preschools um, could have access to them virtually. So we're excited to be sharing them with you today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and then Lorianne can tell you about our agenda for the, for the day. Here we go. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, so today, Mary and I will be presenting information to you about executive function, or you might also hear them called soft skills. Lorianne, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you just play something in front of your microphone because you became a little softer? Um, what did you just move? I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Can there, you hear that's, me? That's really better. Now? Yes, that's better. Thank you. We will talk about what executive function skills are, why they are important, and how you can help your children develop these skills. You are no doubt already teaching your children some of these skills. We'll just put a name to them and explain what you're doing and why it's so important. We will have time for questions at the end, but feel free to use the question and answer screen to ask as we go so you don't forget what it is you're wondering about. We will also be using the chat screen for discussions during the presentation. Mary? All right, just have to get to the right spot to be able to turn the page. Here we go. So I have a question for everyone who's attending today and I'd love for your answer, for you to put your answer in the chat box today. Can you give me one word, just one word to describe life today? And I'll let you, I'll take a moment to let you do that. and. Betsy, Molly, and Lauren, you're certainly welcome to put your word in. We see, I see busy, just like Miss Piggy when she's eating her donuts, and that's probably me as well. Overwhelmed, hectic, I, yes, definitely. Tired, <laughs> tired, certainly, uncertain. Mm -hmm. Busy. Busy, I think busy comes up a lot. When we do this presentation in person, we hear busy a lot, <laughs> um, busy and hectic. I think those are absolutely all great words and absolutely describe what life is like today. And um, what you will find out hopefully in this presentation is that executive function skills 
are the skills that we use um, to help us navigate a world that is busy and hectic and really makes us pretty tired. Um, so I'm going to turn it over quickly to Lorianne to give you a quick refresher on early brain development. Um, you may have heard some of this before, but we thought it was great to just start a little bit with what is going on in little brains. There is a lot going on in little brains. Um, actually, 60% of all of the energy your baby expends is concentrated in the brain. Um, the brain is the only organ not fully developed when the baby is born. At birth, the brain is only 25% of an adult-sized brain. Approximately 80% developed by the age of three and nearly 90% the size of an adult brain by the age of five. Babies are born with 100 billion neurons, about as many stars as are in the Milky Way. Each neuron can have up to 15,000 connections with other neurons. And immediately after birth, this is always so amazing to me, connections begin to form between neurons at the incredible rate of 1 million per second. That's a lot. Wow. <laughs> In this slide, um, you can see how the density of the brain continues to develop um, as more connections are made. So newborn all the way through adulthood, and there's pruning that goes on in between, but just between newborn and two years old, you can see how much more dense it is. All right, Mary. Okay. All right. So researchers, oh, I'm supposed to read it out loud first, sorry. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, we read this one out loud because we feel like it's just so powerful. Executive function and self-regulation skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, focus attention, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. The um, developing child at the Harvard Center um, is one of our resources for this. And we did um, forget to mention at the beginning, all these resources will be emailed to you. We also have links for book lists that we've created. So you don't need to write any of this down. You'll, you'll get it following the webinar. Um, the more we learn about the role of relationships and social emotional development in young children, the more we realize these so-called soft skills are not soft at all, but rather a more predictive of a academic success than are the hard skills. There are a variety of terms that fall under the definition of soft skills. Among them are flexibility, independence, communication, creativity, empathy, self-control, self-motivation, social skills, learning to learn, and on and on and on. Although we agree that hard skills are important for our children, they are just one piece of who our children become. And I wonder, Marianne, if it wouldn't be helpful to, to just give them a little idea of what hard skills are. So get into hard, that later, sorry. <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, you, you might get into that later, but. We do, but go ahead. I know that you do that later. <laughs> yeah, just as we're talking about it now, I thought it would be useful mm -hmm. to say that hard skills are are, are more of the what you know, the things you're learning to do and to and the facts, you know, knowing your numbers, knowing your letters, knowing your colors. Those are quantifiable and measurable, but soft right. skills like Lorianne's talking about now are much harder to, to measure. You, you, I mean, you can you can sort of do it, but it's 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 less measurable. It's more about getting along with others and how we how we interact. So right. So think of the hard skills as the foundation and the soft skills are the cement that build the foundation. Great. Okay, Mary, you go. All right, so uh, next we, oops, sorry about that. Don't know how <laughs> I did that. <laughs> I just right. managed to do something. I don't know how I did it. Let me see if I can put it back. Okay, here we go. There you go. We're going to start with uh, share our first video, share with you. I think it's about, um, I wanna say about six minutes long and it's just a quick introduction 
to um, uh, in executive function um, that we've already sort of talk talked about, but goes a little more in depth. And um, after that, um, we will have some more discussion. And just wanted to let you know, as Lorianne mentioned, um, that after this is over, we will be emailing you links to all these videos so that if you care to watch them again, you can, as well as links to the book lists. We're going to talk to you in a link to all of the, the uh, different uh, websites and resources that we're mentioning as well. Hello, welcome to the first video in Arapahoe Library series on executive function and young children. My name is Lori Ann, and today my colleague Mary and I are going to share with you a short introduction to executive function, what it is, and why it is important to help children develop executive function skills. So, Lori Ann, what is executive function? Executive function is a set of skills that we use every day. We use these mental skills to plan, organize, and complete tasks. Have you ever helped children organize their toys by shape, color, or texture? That's executive function. Have you seen children concentrate on one task? while there are other things happening in the classroom, that's executive function. Have you had children who were able to sit still in story time with their hands to themselves the whole time? That's executive function. That last one is hard. <laughs> it is hard. I've heard one way to explain executive function is that it's like the air traffic controller of the brain or the conductor of an orchestra. It takes all of the information we have and it puts it together in a way that is usable or makes sense. You said that there's a set of skills. Can you tell us more about them? Um, certainly, Mary. Thanks for asking. Executive function combines motor, sensory, communication, and thinking skills that we've developed. Beginning at a very young age, we apply this combination of skills to daily activities and situations such as playing, learning, and socializing. These skills develop over time at different rates in individual children. They fall into three categories, working memory, self-regulation, and mental flexibility. They overlap each other and are used at the same time to complete tasks. That's a great overview, but can you tell me a little bit more about each of those three categories? Absolutely, Mary. Working memory is a skill that helps us remember and apply information to everyday activities to put our memories to work. An example of working memory would be remembering a routine. A family's bedtime routine might be bath, teeth, pajamas, book, hugs, kisses, sleep. Also working memory <clears throat> can be holding on to information long enough to accomplish a task at hand, like following directions or making a plan and following through with it. The next one is self-regulation, which sometimes you hear called self-control. And it involves the ability to stop behavior or not act on an emotion until a more appropriate time. This is an important skill for school readiness as it helps us get along with others, wait our turn, and pay attention. The last one is mental flexibility. This is our ability to switch between multiple subjects efficiently. This is a key skill set needed to participate in school, play, and social environments that require problem solving, persevering, and trying new things. You mentioned school, play, and social environments. Can you tell us more about how kids use executive function in each of these situations? I can do that. During play, children learn to take turns and share with peers. They learn to be okay with losing, 
and they learn to follow directions from adults. While socializing, children learn to focus and pay attention to people as they talk. When they're babies, they imitate others. But as they grow, they learn to use gestures and expressions during communication. They also learn to talk through issues with their friends and find a solution. As they get older, they organize gatherings with their friends and follow through with those plans. In school, again, they learn to sit with a group, raise their hands, work with others, pay attention to the teacher, follow directions, among many other things. Thanks, Lorianne, and thank you for joining us for this. I'm just going to pause it there because this is just this next part is just the thank you for joining us. Here are some resources. Go to our website part, which I don't I think we can give you at the very end. So um, I'm going to skip ahead to our next slide where we have a quotation from Kathy Hirsch Pasek, who is a researcher who um, is an expert on play, the importance of play and child development. And I think this quotation is is notable because um, it talks about how the way the world is now, um, where we've got all this information, um, those of us who are able to take that information and put it together in a different way, in a new way, in a creative way, um, are the people that are going to really succeed. And so um, we've already talked about this somewhat in the video, but I want to give you a little more context about why these skills are important. Um, you hear people often talk about how they can find anything on the internet. I mean, we certainly hear that in libraries. Um, yes, you, you can, um, but the internet can't teach us how to function in society, how to use the information we learned, and how to use our critical thinking skills, which are definitely a very important, especially when there is so much information available to us on the internet. So as adults, we need to be able to multitask, focus on our work despite numerous distractions um, and display creative thinking in order to be successful. And children need to develop these same skills. They depend on these emerging skills to help them as they learn to read, write, remember the steps in doing a math problem, and take part in class discussions or group projects. For example, when learning to read, a child uses their working memory to be able to uh, pull up the information they know about letter sounds um, and uh, also background knowledge on words they've seen before in order to be able to just decode and sound out words and um, also understand what they're reading. So they're using executive function skills um, when they are learning to read. When a child enters formal schooling like kindergarten, um, having well-developed executive function skills can be a, a can determine a good transition to kindergarten um, because a lot of these skills are things that they need in order to get along with others, to get their work done, to stay on task. And so the teacher isn't having to spend as much time helping mediate between kids or help them uh, do the assignment and focus. The teacher can teach the hard skills, the, or the hard information, the, more, the information, they don't have to work so quite as hard. Although these skills are still, you know, continue to develop throughout our lifetime. So, you know, not a child who isn't going to have them set when they enter kindergarten. That's, uh, you know, wouldn't that be nice, but it really isn't. We continue all throughout our lives to develop these skills. I mean, I personally struggle with a little self-regulation sometimes. <laughs> um, but on the flip side, children who are underdeveloped in their executive function might become adolescents who fall behind in their homework, have difficulty completing projects, and have difficulty working with others. So that can really be a hindrance. Um, they have found that executive function skills are more predictive of success in school than your IQ. Um, because our IQ can maybe predict what we know, but executive function can predict how we will use what we know. So why do we care about this? Um, I think we all want our children to be well prepared to start kindergarten. Um, and preschooler self-regulation skills are directly linked to their early literacy, vocabulary, and math skills. Um, learning scientists have shown repeatedly that children who can't focus and pay attention can't learn nearly as well as those who can. Um, but on the, on the good side of that, executive function skills can be taught. They can be learned. And so hopefully you'll get a little more information about that today and we will be able to connect you with resources to learn even more if you're interested. Um, children can absolutely 
learn these skills and you can help them and you're already helping them, I'm sure. So on to my next slide. Um, I'm going to just give you a quick reminder as what you heard in the video of the three parts of executive function. Self-regulation, I think, is the one that we hear about most often. Um, and sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm looking at my notes and I'm confusing myself. Self-regulation is, is self-control, body control, um, emotion control, um, all of those things, the focus. Uh, mental flexibility is, um, we will learn more about that a little later, but it's also about um, being able to be creative, think differently, put information together in new ways, and working memory, of course, is that being able to put your memories to work, to pull information and use it in your brain right at that moment. Um, all of these skills are highly interrated. Inter interrelated and the successful application of executive function requires them to operate in coordination with each other. So you might think, you know, you need your, your working memory to go along with your self-regulation sometimes and, and all of these things work together. Um, so next slide, I have a little cute little image of, um, whoops, Went too, too far ahead, sorry. Boss baby, because um, when we hear the word executive, the first thing that comes to my mind is the boss, you know, the executive, the CEO, the chief executive officer. In this case, the executive is not the boss of the brain. Um, it's more like a manager. So the way um, I've found it's, it's cool to think about it is if it's the conductor of an orchestra or um, the, um, an air traffic controller. So it's taking all that information um, all of the things that are coming into our brains and putting it together in a usable way. Think about an orchestra, um, all those instruments playing. If they didn't have a conductor who was keeping them on time and bringing in certain instruments and quieting down other instruments, it would just be a big cacophonous mess. So um, our executive function is taking all those things and putting them together. And I think we already talked about that hard skills are the, the measurable things, but soft skills are the more how we get along with others. So um, children are developing these skills from birth, as we, as we heard. And in infancy, interactions with adults are what help babies focus their attention, build working memory, and manage their reactions to stimulating experiences. One example is how a baby responds to an adult's eye gaze. There's been a, there's, I think it's called sort of the eye gaze test, where they look that babies are more likely to look, and po focus their attention, on whatever the caregiver is paying attention to. They'll match that eye gaze, and thus they begin to learn what's important and what they need to pay attention to. And then as children get older, through creative play, children practice honing their attention and focus, their working memory, and their self-control. They're planning, flexible problem solving, and adults are playing a critical role in supporting and scaffolding their development. And by scaffolding, um, we mean you know, making it increasingly just a little bit harder so that they can try out those skills and, um, and uh, learn a little bit more. They help children create challenging tasks, model behavior, that's a big part of it. And if you were with us in January for our, um, not January, September for our session with, um, um, oh my gosh, her name is escaping me. I apologize, the, the child psychologist. Um, she talked a lot about yeah. how to model, huh? I'm sorry, Jen, 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 Jen Turner, Turner, thank you. Yes, she talked a lot about uh, modeling, how adults model things for children, um, especially with related to emotions. And that is one thing that you are already doing that helps children um, learn and develop their executive function. And then gradually we step back and let them manage and process, manage the process independently and learn from their mistakes, which is another part of this, which is hard for all of us to learn that we can make mistakes and we can, and we can keep going and we can, um, and we can try again. So now we're gonna spend a little more time with one of the skills, um, the one that I think often people are most interested in, which is self-regulation. Um, certainly we will want help to help children learn how to manage their emotions and their bodies. Um, so we're gonna get into that a little bit more in depth, and then we will talk about some activities that you can do at home or perhaps are already doing at home that help grow those skills because you are the most important teacher in your child's life. So we have another short video for you that talks more specifically about what um, encompasses executive function. And I see there's something in the chat, but I, I'm, is there, are there any questions we need to answer right now? I haven't looked at the chat. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. All right, here we go. Hi, 
Hello, and welcome to the third video in Arapaho Library's series on executive function and young children. My name is Lori Ann, and today Mary and I are going to share with you more information on one of the parts of executive function, self-regulation. Simply put, self-regulation skills enable us to set priorities and resist impulsive actions or responses. It involves the ability to stop a behavior or not act on an emotion until a more appropriate time. This includes controlling our bodies and our emotions, self-monitoring our own appropriate and inappropriate behavior. Lorian, when might we use our self-regulation skills? Self-regulation is the ability to understand and manage your behavior and your reaction to feelings and things that happen around you. It includes being able to regulate reactions to emotions like frustration or excitement. <laughs> Calm down after something exciting or upsetting happens focus on a task, control impulses, and learn behavior that helps you get along with other people. Those seem like very important skills for growing up. Can you tell me more about what self-regulation looks like in young children? Absolutely, Mary. Let's start with empathy. I've seen children as young as one express empathy for one another. I observed a toddler willingly share her lovey with another child who was crying for his mom. The teacher said to her, he feels sad because his mommy left. A toddler understands exactly how that feels. Her mommy left too. Sharing, it's a big one, isn't it? Um, Yes. We, we so often have the expectation that our two-year-olds need to share. However, young children are egocentric by nature, and we expect them to share when it is against their nature to do so. We can teach them to share through modeling. Teacher says to a child, you don't have any glue for your picture. I can share mine with you. Another one that we are concerned about as caregivers is taking turns. Again, a skill we teach through modeling or talking to them through their emotion. We often see children on the playground pushing one another so they can go down the slide. Explain that taking turns means first he goes and you go next. Thank you for taking turns. Remember, it's against their nature to do so, and it will take time and repetition. Play a board game with them and take turns. Self-control. We talk about this a lot, yes. self-control, and how important that is to school readiness. So self-control is primarily a social skill Children use it to learn how to keep their behavior, emotions, and impulses in check. Hitting, kicking, grabbing, biting are all impulses young children have because they do not have the proper words to use yet. Teachers can help by saying, you don't like it when she takes your ball. It makes you feel angry. Let's play ball together. When children are older, adults can help them with an appropriate conversation. What did she do? She took my ball. How does that make you feel? Angry. Is it okay to feel angry? Yes, it is okay to feel angry. Is it okay to hit? No. What else could we do to solve the problem? Play ball together? Yes. That 
that's great, and I like how you included the child in making the choice of what to do next. So, Lorianne, why is it important for young children to develop their self-regulation? Um, self-regulation is important because as your children grow, it will help them do things like learn at school. Because self-regulation gives your child the ability to sit and listen in the classroom. Very important. Behave in socially acceptable ways. Because self-regulation gives your child the ability to control impulses. Make friends. Because self-regulation gives your child the ability to take turns in games share toys, and express emotions in appropriate ways. Become more independent. Because self-regulation gives your child the ability to make good decisions about her behavior and learn how to behave in a new situation with less guidance from you. Manage stress because self-regulation helps your child learn that she can cope with strong feelings and gives her the ability to calm herself down after getting angry. That's wonderful information, Lorian. Thank you. Are there specific milestones in the development of self-regulation that caregivers can watch for? Oh, absolutely, Mary. Great question. Um, children develop self-regulation by watching their parents and caregivers. Self-regulation starts when children are babies. It develops most in the toddler and preschool years, but it also keeps developing right into adulthood. Babies self-soothe in many different ways, including sucking their fingers or on a pacifier, holding a special blanket, toy, or animal. Toddlers can wait short times for food and toys, but toddlers still might snatch toys from other children if it's something they really want. And tantrums happen when toddlers struggle with regulating some strong emotions. Preschoolers. Preschoolers are starting to know how to play with other children and understand what's expected of them. For example, sitting to listen to a book being read, having a conversation about the book, and staying focused on that one task. Adults can play a major role in children's ability to identify, understand, and express emotions in a healthy way. The following strategies are key in fostering emotional literacy in young children. Express your own feelings. Label your child's feelings or the feelings of another child. Initially, they understand happy, sad, tired, hungry, and mad. Thank you, Lorianne. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Again, we'll, we'll skip the thank you part because we'll say thank you at the very end. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lori Ann. So at this point, we actually have a question for you, but I want to say um, before I ask that question that right now our current research on children and mask wearing by adults, mask wearing by their um, classmates, by their friends, by the by your friends, the other parents, what they're finding is that it's actually the most difficult in identifying emotions um, because they use our whole face. From newborn on, this is how they tell a feeling, an emotion. And because we have it covered up, that just makes it even more important at home when they can see your face that you're naming those emotions. Um, and talking about and making a plan for how do you respond to that, to that emotion. Um, otherwise, when we're out, 
what the research says is make sure you're using your hands more now, make sure you're using your eyes more. Um, so they have some way of telling um, what that emotion is. So that's just a side note. Um, okay, so in the chat, if you could respond to this, what kinds of things do your kids do that demonstrate self-regulation to you? What kinds of things do you see them doing today, tonight? Um, or things that you noticed where they might need a little more support because right. it's definitely right. so, so either know. way. Yeah. Uh, taking um, a deep breath. The children are taking a deep breath. That's a great. Yeah, we breath. need to do that too. <laughs> I know, I need to do that. <laughs> Lots sure. of deep breaths. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a great one. Sit down and pause, absolutely, mm -hmm. which can be challenging. And I think, you know, those of us who do story time, you know, we, we kind of have learned how long it takes for how long they can sit and, and wait before they need to get up and wiggle and move. Pause mid tantrum right. to listen, very challenging. They don't want to listen to us when they've got all those big feelings. No, and yeah. once that tantrum starts, um, I have a daughter who experiences high anxiety and we learned that once that tantrum or panic attack starts, you just have to ride it out and let it finish and then, mm -hmm. and then talk, talk about it afterward. Yeah, sometimes it's hard right in that moment. Naming it feelings. in that moment. Yeah. Learning to take turns and sit quietly. Oh, She's taking turns. Athletes. Wonderful. That's a wonderful place to do that. And I, yeah, and we definitely try to work on that in our story time programs right. at the library, the taking turns, the sitting quietly, keeping your hands to yourself. And <laughs> I'm throw in my funny story about a time when I was doing, oh. a, sorry, preschool. Uh, I was doing a story times in a preschool classroom and um, I was a visitor from the library. And so the class would come to the library and sit down and listen to stories. And it was a bilingual Spanish and English classroom. And I had a, a young person sitting in the front row. Now I have to explain that this was on Valentine's day and they were having a special Valentine's day party that day in the classroom. So um, this young man was wearing a full tuxedo. He had bow tie, he had cummerbund, he had jacket, he was in a complete tuxedo. And um, at one point he looks right over at his friend next door and I notice him just reach out, punch him right in the face. And you know, he just really, he had no words to express how he was feeling at that moment. So he decided to punch his friend while wearing a tuxedo. And of course the teacher took control at that point and talked to him about it. But you know, that was an example of him just not knowing that not having the tools to be able to um, use his words and say, I don't like what you're doing. And I don't like what my neighbor is doing at this moment. So I'm going to just use my body, which is, you know, they have to learn that that's not appropriate. And right. what is it is an appropriate response. So. And some of that physical um, reaction also is the lack of language mm -hmm. and the ability to explain how they feel and, and, Mm -hmm. So that just comes from us continuing yeah. to label it and, and talk about it and how we respond. Um, we had somebody say empathy. It's always so amazing to watch as our children really become, um, really get to that point of understanding how others feel. Mm -hmm. um, and that also I needs to work on waiting until we're finished talking. That's a tough one. That's hard. I find sometimes with, with my kiddos, if I, if I touch them on the shoulder or something, hold their hand, um, sometimes they're a little bit more able to wait. And that just comes with age and um, development. Yeah. Us so you're sort of them. acknowledging that you're hearing them and they don't need to keep saying, exactly. mom, mom, mommy, mommy, mom. Right, right. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Know, you. We're almost yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And again, we have to give them a lot of grace because they really are just learning these skills. Yeah. Um, let's get into the fun part, hopefully, of this, which is where we're going to show you another short video. But we're going to give you some examples of, I think, six different activities that you mm -hmm. can do at home that might help grow self-regulation. And then after that, if, you, if you're thinking of any things that you do at home that also help grow these skills, we'd love to hear about those as well. So right. play this video. When it comes up, there we go. Welcome to another video in Arapaho Library's series on executive function and young children. My name is Mary and today Lori Ann and I would like to share some ideas for activities you can do at home or in the classroom 
to help young children grow their self-regulation skills. Lorianne, can you start by reminding us what self-regulation is? Yes. Self-regulation is the ability to understand and manage your behavior and your reactions to feelings and things happening around you. Challenging skill for all of us, I think. All of us. <laughs> so we've got a few ideas that use things you can find around the home or in the classroom that help children work on this skill. And here's my first idea. One way we can learn to control our bodies is by learning strategies to calm ourselves down. And deep breathing helps with this. And here are three ways you can try deep breathing with children. And the first is called hot chocolate breathing. So we cup our hands like we're holding a cup of hot chocolate. And then we pretend we're blowing on it to cool, cool it down. So we take a deep breath in and then blow right on your hot chocolate to cool it down. Let's try it again. So it's a deep concentrated breath. Um, the second strategy we pretend our fingers are candles on a birthday cake, and then we have to blow all the all of them out. So, so there you have five deep breaths. And finally, we have starfish starfish breathing. <laughs> so hold your hand like it's your starfish, and then we're going to move our finger along as we breathe in and out. So. Breathe in and out. So there's another five deep breaths. I feel calmer already. I do too. I really like that starfish idea. That's really different. Yeah. So, Lorianne, what's your first idea? Um, my first idea is having the children copy facial expressions at home or in the classroom, and then remembering to name emotions also. All children early on know happy, sad, tired, hungry, mad. So it's expanding that emotional vocabulary and connecting the face with the word. If we're angry and we go, I am so angry at you. That kind of doesn't relate the correct message, right? So my first suggestion, of course, is start with picture books with faces showing emotions, or when you're reading a book, pointing out the faces of the people in the story. Um, you can practice making those faces and naming those emotions that you're finding and reading about in the book. You can also play a really easy game that can get progressively harder and is also excellent for memory work um, and good for eye contacting, understanding, um, emotions. So the easiest version is as follows. First person in the circle does an emotion face. Okay, Mary, go ahead. And then I have to copy that. Um, we want to make sure though we go, oh, Mary looks surprised and then, and then copy it. Then the next person goes and maybe I just, and so now we have to remember oh, surprised and then sad. So that's the memory work. The second version, the first person might do the happy and the surprised and then move on. So you're doing two at the time. Um, and then the last one, the hardest would be as your kids get older into pre-K and things, you might do three. And we're talking small groups of children or just the children in your family. Um, use the same words to describe how you feel. Don't forget to tell kids, right now I'm feeling frustrated. I was late leaving for work, I ran out of gas, I locked my keys in the car, now I'm at work late and I'm feeling really frustrated about that. Um, and children get it, but when they see us using those words, it helps them to understand how that feels, what that word means. Um, being able to name our emotions is a very important step 
in building self-regulation skills. Okay, what's your next one? So another idea I have for growing self-regulation is any kind of freeze dance. This is a really simple idea, of course. We dance, and then at some point, the music stops, and we freeze. This can be challenging for little bodies. <laughs> to make it a little harder, we can add poses into the mix. I learned this idea from the tools of the mind curriculum. So you start the music, and while it's playing, you hold up a card with a pose on it. And when it stops, when the music stops, we're dancing, we're dancing, we're dancing. And when the music stops, you freeze. And you pose in the um, pose that you see on the sheet. So you're going to do simple poses like this with just your arms and your feet out for littler kids. But as they get older, you can make them more challenging, like this one with one foot up and one arm, um, so trying to match it. So it gets a little bit harder that way. Um, and you can find a number of great freeze dances on children's music CDs. You can borrow those from the library. For example, Hat Palmer has one called the Wiggy Wiggy Wiggles, which is lots of fun. Um, and Jim Gill has a fun one called the Silly Dance Party. I love that one. And we dance any way we want to in the Silly Dance Party, and then we dance a little bit slower, and then we dance with a partner, and in between, we have to freeze. I really like the um, the Wiggles have a, a great freeze song too, and I think it's just called Freeze. I think I think you can find a lot of those kids songs just by searching freeze freeze dance or freeze song. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and great to do as a as a family with the kiddos or in the classroom. Yeah, or you can just play any music you have at home and just like music. Yeah, players, just pause it and everybody freezes. Right, great listening skills. Um, so my next one, again, is one that we know, but we don't always think about what we're teaching our children or the skills they get. So playing Simon Says, Red Light, Green Light, Stop, Go, it makes all of us, it makes the children have to stop their bodies that are in motion, just like the freeze game does. Um, the Stop, Go, you can have the Stop, Go sign. Um, so that they can see that and begin to um, connect the word with the writing. Uh, so that, that is also fun. Other one child is the leader. The rest of the children ask, Mother, may I take 10 steps? Mother, may I hop three times? And again, listening, no, right? yes. And that would be fun if you're at home. It could be mother, may I, father, may I, big brother, may I, um, grandma, may I. Right, and anybody can play that game. Um, so I, I really like that. And again, just stopping the movement of our bodies is self-regulation. Yes, it is. I just want to acknowledge really quickly that we see the hands being raised, and, and either that's that might be a, a, just a mistake or a quirk. But we're going to finish this video, and then we'll ask for your questions. Yes, absolutely. So, of course, my last idea involves books. <laughs> Self-regulation isn't just controlling our bodies, but it's also controlling our emotions and our reactions. And this includes not speaking until it's your turn to speak. But anyone who's worked with young children knows that this is a skill they have to practice. <laughs> you can encourage that practice with books by giving the kids something to look for in a story or pay a close attention to. For example, with the book Truman by Jean Reedy and Lucy yeah. Cummins, this little, uh, dandelion that's in her hair appears a number of places in the story. So you might ask the kids to just keep their eye out for that dandelion and then go back later and see where you find it. Um, but they can't tell you when they find it. That's the hard part is not yelling it out right away. Right. <laughs> or with the book, one of our favorites, Pete the Cat, I Love When I Choose by Eric Lippman and mm -hmm. uh, James Dean. Of course, um, if you've read this, you know that he loves his white shoes, but then he steps in a pile of strawberries. And the question asks, what color did it turn his shoes? So you ask the kids to, if they, if they know, 
zip their lips and see if they can not yell it out until it's yeah. until you ask for them to yell out red. <laughs> that can be a little bit tricky to, to hold our hands or learning to raise your hand and waiting to be called right. on to answer a question. So um, either one of those works just great for building that self-regulation. And those are all skills that we need when our kiddos start school. Absolutely. Just raising their hand and being able to stop and not Absolutely. shout out an answer. Yes. So my last idea for self-regulation is to have the children copy a rhythm. It can be a rhythm you're clapping your hands, slow, fast, loud, quiet, three times slow, one time fast. Um, you can use spoons, drumsticks, rhythm sticks, drums, the kitchen counter. Um, another way that you can do this is to pick a theme. Okay, so maybe food. And think of a word like banana. And then we're going to clap out banana. Banana. So we're also breaking that word down into the smaller sounds. But just getting the children to hear and be able to repeat that rhythm. Um, and then you can think of bigger words like um, chrysalis. That's a good one, a good right? Um, and kids love big words. Do the dinosaurs and do the dinosaur names. Brachiosaurus. Ooh, Is that five? See, and so that would be good. And you could say it real slowly. Us, or you can go Brachiosaurus right, and make sure they're doing it five times. So it's just really great um, self regulation, making them slow down. Um, another way. Loud or quiet, so now you can use your body as well. Use your feet, you can stomp. Um, and, and add the rhythm in those stomps. Um, you can do that with music even, right? And we're listening to the music and doing it to the beat. Um, so you can see how the game, you can scaffold it and make it harder and harder as the children get older and catch on to the games that we're playing. Absolutely. I wonder how many syllables there are in the word super calibre fragile -istic. <laughs> I'll count them later. <laughs> While Lorianne counts, I want to say thank you for joining us for this. So we can skip the thank yous, I think, again. And uh, thank you also. Uh, I Sorry, I think I got muted in there because I was typing a response to, to one of my colleagues here. And, <laughs> and I think you could hear it, so I apologize for that. Um, so some broad categories. You heard some specific activities there in the video some broad categories of, of activities that you can do that help grow self-regulation are things like any anytime you have to take a turn. So playing a game, um, going down the slide, you know, anytime you have to practice that, it, it helps grow that self-regulation. Anytime, as Lorianne talked about earlier, when they have to try, share, um, and again, with young, especially young toddlers, that's against their nature. So we have to do a lot of modeling of what sharing looks like. They also don't automatically know what the word share means so we have to show them and um, and model that to help them get the idea um, any kind of activity like a freeze game as was mentioned where they have to move their bodies and then stop uh, suddenly or control or you know keep their hands to themselves any of those kinds of things help to um, grow that self-regulation um, Anytime, yeah, we just said keep your hands to yourselves. Don't don't punch your neighbor while wearing a tuxedo. Um, any kind of game where you have to concentrate and pay careful attention. So an I spy game is a good example where you have to look very carefully at something. Um, and in the pictures here, we've got examples of some activities that we've done in the library, um, like uh, the roads on the floor. We were playing a little, they had their trucks out and they had to negotiate um, who was gonna go where, how we were taking those turns, who got to go first. Also just figuring out who gets to use which truck can be a big deal too. So working on figuring out those kinds of things um, involves uh, you know, managing your emotions and your bodies. Um, there's an I spy bin at the bottom there. Um, and the, the child who's using a Q-tip to make a pattern on a star, um, that involves a lot of finger strength and controlling your hands and hand-eye coordination. 
which goes along with self-regulation. Being able to really hold your hands still and pinch something like that um, is, is a skill that we grow. And also with the young man who is putting um, pom-poms down the um, paper towel tubes with tweezers, that involves a lot of um, controlling of his body and his hands. So, um, I would love to ask next, um, first, was anyone who had their hand up, did they, were there any questions? I know that one of those hands was a mistake, unfortunately. Um, sometimes Zoom does its own thing, but if anyone has a question, feel free to um, put it right in the chat and we'll, we'll get to it right away. Um, Mary, but, let's do a few um, activities that they might be doing and, um, and then we can answer questions if they have some. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. So what we would like for you to do now is if you have any ideas, um, we learn so much from sharing with each other. Do you have any ideas at, that you do at home that might help grow self-regulation? We'd love to hear your ideas and what's been working for you. Um, mm -hmm. If you have any examples for us, we'd love to shout them out so that everybody can try what's working for you. So go ahead and put those in the chat if you have any. I see Awesome. Red light, green light. Yep, that's one of those games that I Simon think says. I played as a kid and is a great way. Simon says also, yeah, I, you know, it's harder for elementary school kids even to not do, to remember that they can't do it until Simon says. Cooking and baking. Yes, that I think involves a lot of, uh, you know, control with scooping and, you know, there's a lot of fine motor stuff. Um, and, and there's you know, a lot of food you want to eat right away, but you have to wait. Having to wait till it bakes, that's really hard. So follow the, follow leader. the leader is a great activity to do to grow self-regulation. And then we also learn about taking turns when we take turns being the leader because everybody okay. wants to be the leader. Um, I was reading a book at um, story time yesterday called Roar. And it's one of the ones that has the little pocket that opens up. And so I had the kids, they could roar as long as the lion's mouth was open. Mm -hmm. But I told them, as soon as you see it close, mm -hmm. no more roaring. And they got it. They, it took them a couple tries. But just, just doing that really simple game during story time, great self-control. Well, Lorianne, we are very close to the end, and we did want to leave some time for questions. No. Um, as happens with us, we get too excited about talking about these subjects. So we've got, we'll just, I think we should just skip through these quick slides. Um, these are some book suggestions that we have for you that also, so reading a book is always a great way to grow self-regulation. Um, all of these book ideas, though, will be on the book list link that we are yes. sending you. So uh, yes. don't worry about writing them down now. You will get them in um in a link and then you can take a look at them. So, but we would love to leave this last couple of minutes that we have, sorry, we didn't leave more. We thought this would not be, go as long. Um, and for any questions you might have. And um, if, if you think of any questions, you know, overnight, tomorrow as you're going through your day, um, you can email either one of us. Mm -hmm. If you can't remember ours, you can email Betsy and she'll forward it to us and we can um, help you. That's that way too. send you a link with a link to the book list, the videos if you want to watch again, mm -hmm. as well as a list of resources, parents for parents, books and websites, all right. of the ones that we mentioned. And um, if you may have noticed when we were watching those videos, one of them said it was number four and one said it was number seven. And that's because we have filmed videos about working memory and um, uh, mental flexibility, the other two skills we talked about, and those will be going live on the website soon, along with activity videos. So there are four additional videos. Um, Lauren asked, how important are transitions with executive function skills? And how do kids use executive function skills during transitions? You want to field that one, Lauren? Oh, great question, Lauren. Thanks. Um, I think that is a lot of the self-regulation, not pushing, not shoving. I've got my coat on and I'm going to be first in line and um, I'm ready to go and mommy still has to finish my lunch. I mean, there's just so much going on. I think what helps the most is giving them um, a warning and more than just minutes, but um, mommy's going to finish this. Daddy's going to, you know, go get his shirt on for work and then, and then we're going to go so really solid kinds of things, not just time amounts because kids um, struggle with that. Yeah, I, I, have, I have to set the timer for myself so I know it's like 
I have 10 minutes before I have to leave. Um, so anything like that that's, that you can share with them that's real solid and not just a minute. Yeah, um, and self-regulation, it's also that mental flexibility piece that we talked about. At the right. Beginning. Being able to switch gears is, is hard for right. us too. So I think- Because we're, we're ready to leave and then the phone rings and then we're on the phone for three minutes and they're all ready to go or- I think it, what Brian suggested is wonderful. Also, I know some kids really thrive by having a picture picture clues in the classroom like this this is what we're doing at this time and then after that we're going to have this thing that's going to happen and maybe taking those pictures off as that activity ends right. i know that sometimes works with children who are on the spectrum just they need right. the routine and they need you to can do those at home as well the other thing that might work too for time is um they have timers that are different colors and there's a two minute timer a three minute timer and a five minute timer and you can have the turn that over so they know five minutes and then it's time for bath, but they can visually see that. So that helps too sometimes. Laurieann and Mary. Yes. Past the five o'clock hour. How did that happen? <laughs> I don't know, but I learned something new every time I uh, see you two together and see these videos. And I hope that uh, our patrons also got a lot out of it. I, I I think you had some great ideas. So thank you very much. And don't, you can view these videos or you will soon be able to view the videos on the Arapaho Libraries uh, website. They'll be linked there. And look for an email containing links to um, the self-regulation book list. Yes. And also like to remind everyone that we have gone back to in-person programming. Um, in October, so check our zero to five website where you'll find the new story time list, family place programs coming up in February, and February, Little Explorers, Ready Set Kindergarten, and much more. Betsy, I just want to point out too, there's a book list for um, the children's books as well. Yes. The books for the parents, but also mm -hmm. ones that they can do with the kids. I will send both, yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.